All right, so this is going to be a fairly in-depth overview of lighting in Unreal Engine 4. I'm going to go over all of the uh, different light types, their properties, and how to get the most out of your, uh, your lighting in Unreal Engine 4. I'm also going to cover a few lighting techniques that are not exposed by default in Unreal Engine. Uh, you have to modify the uh, configurable any files in order to expose the values. Uh, I'm going to do this all as one long video covering everything, but I will put timestamps down in the description uh, so you can kind of skip through to the to the areas that you're interested in or that uh, that you may need help with. So I'm going to start off with the most common uh, basic uh, light actor, which is the point light. Obviously, in order to uh, put it in the scene, you just click it over here in your uh, in the lights, or you can search for it in the uh, in the uh, Place, uh, place tab up here, and you can just literally just drag it over. And you can just drag it over into your scene. I've already got one placed, and the lighting has already been built. The light is set to static, and uh, I'm building the light with uh, production settings, which I'm going to use for uh, this entire video. Now, as you can see, the shadow is very rough. Um, it's got a very hard edge. I'm using mostly default settings for the light, other than intensity and attenuation radius, but I haven't changed anything else. Um, so the point light is actually a light actor that you want to avoid whenever possible uh, because it does render as if it were uh, basically six spotlights uh, spherically projected to a single point. Um, so it is uh, more, it's almost six times uh, more expensive to run than a single spotlight in most cases, especially if you're running uh, fully dynamic. So um, most, uh, for, for most uh, Lighting setups for your environment, you can get away with a spotlight, um, and you can go with a full 180-degree uh, cone on your spotlight, uh, which we'll get into later. So the first thing I'm going to uh, go over um, is, obviously, your uh, mobility modes. So mobility tells the engine uh, whether or not your light is static, stationary, or movable. So static means everything is completely baked, and it's got the quickest rendering time. It's also going to be the, uh, the highest quality uh, Cases. Stationary is kind of a hybrid between static and mobile. It's uh, partially baked, uh, you get shadow maps and, and all that good stuff, but you also get dynamic shadows on movable objects. Um, you can't move it uh, during runtime, but you can change the color, intensity, and things like that uh, at runtime. Movable means everything is completely dynamic. Um, anything can be adjusted at runtime, the position, um, color, intensity, etc. Uh, scale, location, rotation, I'm obviously not going to go over that. I'm sure you know what that is by now. So under the light options, this is where you're going to find, or, or the light tab, this is where you're going to find most of the options for this actor. So intensity is obviously how uh, bright the light is, uh, your light color, color of the light. Your attenuation radius, um, as represented by the sphere, is how far the light actually casts itself. So um, obviously if you make it higher values, it's going to go farther. you make it lower values, it's going to be a, a tighter uh, sphere. Um, down here, you have uh, three options for source. So you have source radius, you have soft source radius, and you have source length. So I'm going to go over each of these three independently because they are uh, pretty important. When, uh, so uh, right now, uh, this is a pretty close representation. The lighting needs to be rebuilt because I moved it, but this is a pretty close representation of what the shadow looked like with the default settings without any of the source radius, uh, without any source, uh, source radius information changed. So I'm going to change the source radius value to 100. Now you'll see that the light now has this, uh, this sphere around it. And you'll see that it changes as I adjust the uh, source radius. So what this is doing is it's telling the engine uh, where to actually radiate the light from. So if it's set to 0 for source radius, it's actually just going to uh, cast the light from, uh, from the 0 point in the center of the light. If you adjust the radius, it's going to cast the light uh, from the surface of this sphere um, which represents the source radius. So what this allows you to do is get much softer shadows um, and uh, different light bounce and all that good stuff, and it's, it's a good way of, uh, of having much better lighting. So I'm going to set the source radius uh, to 50 for now, uh, 50 units. And as you can see, it's a smaller sphere, but it's still bigger than uh, the zero point. Then I'm going to build my light. So you can see I rebuilt the light with a source radius of 50 units. And as you can see, the shadow is already uh, softer. It's got a... Uh, 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 more noticeable penumbra. It's not just a hard edge. You can see the fall off on the sphere is also uh, more noticeable. Now I'm going to bump this source radius up to 100. 
that's going to be double the units. Um, actually, I'll make it uh, 150. That's more noticeable. Then I'm going to build lighting again. Now, as you can see, my sphere is much larger. Uh, my sphere of, uh, I guess you call it light, uh, light emission. And the shadow here is um, reflecting that. So as you can see, it's coming from that sphere. Um, the light is actually being projected from the edges of the sphere. It's making the shadow much, much softer, and it's basically lighting uh, in this direction. Now, another thing that the uh, source radius affects is, its, uh, is the uh, light's uh, reflection on non-rough surfaces. I'm going to change the surface to uh, be completely um, reflective. I'm going to change the roughness down to zero. So it's no longer rough. Now, if I bring this light down, you'll see that this is how the light is uh, represented on a uh, non-rough surface, on a glossy surface, right? So if I adjust this radius, that's what's affecting its uh, uh, reflection on a non-rough surface. Set it to zero, you can see it just shows as a little, uh, little point of light. So I'm going to put it back to 50. Now this soft source radius, this doesn't actually affect any lighting. What it does is it affects how soft this uh, representation of the light on a non-rough surface is. So if I scale this up, you can see it makes it much uh, blurry and much softer. So you can really fine tune um, how your light is represented in the world, not just how the light, uh, the actual baked lighting is represented, but the, the point light itself. So the uh, next radius value that you'll see here is um, source length. Um, so this is the same thing as source radius, but it can actually allow you to draw out a capsule shape. So I set it to 50. You'll see that it's, um, it's, you have two spheres, and it's kind of a capsule shape. If I go to uh, scale it out, you'll see it becomes a capsule. And as you can see, the reflection in the background is, rep, uh, is reflecting that shape. So what this is useful for is um, if you have, say, like a, uh, a fluorescent light in the ceiling or something like that, then you want to emit light uh, from the bulbs, obviously, the, the long light tubes. So your reflection uh, should represent that, and your uh, actual light emission should represent that. So um, that is the, the whole purpose for these, uh, for source radius, soft source radius, and source length. So um, you would want to adjust these, obviously, uh, source radius. If you have a light bulb, you'd want to scale the sphere to um, align or, or be flush with the uh, geometry for your light bulb. If you have like a uh, canister light or something like that, then you'd want to expand it to match that. Uh, if you have, uh, like I said before, a ceiling light, uh, like fluorescent light bulbs, you'd want to uh, scale it up to match that. So that way it looks uh, realistic in your world. Set everything back to its default value, move it back into position, and set roughness back to one. All right, so we've gone through all the uh, radius values, which are actually some of the most important and give you the most control over lighting. Um, the next thing I'm going to go into is uh, utilizing temperature. So temperature gives you Kelvin values for your light. So you can actually scale uh, to real world numbers. As you can see as I'm sliding back and forth, it's changing the uh, temperature of the light. So if you check this use temperature, uh, use temperature box, it'll allow you to do that rather than um, light color. Uh, check box, whether or not it affects world. So this is, uh, basically static geometry and all that stuff, whether or not you want it to affect that. Whether or not it casts shadows. So you can bake the light where you just get the numbers of the light itself, but it won't actually cast shadows. Indirect lighting intensity, this is how intense the light bounces. So I'm going to leave it as a value of 1. Um, I'm going to change my source radius to something like 50, so it's actually 100. So it's a little soft. I'm going to build lighting uh, with light bounce set to 1. All right. So this is a indirect lighting intensity value of one. Um, source radius is set to 100. I'm going to set this indirect lighting intensity value to five, so you can see the difference. Build my lighting. All right. So with the light rebuilt with a indirect uh, lighting intensity of five, as you can see, the scene is much brighter because light is being bounced around more. Um, you can see if I go into lighting only. that the orange is actually being bounced off of this cylinder. Uh, it's very, very subtle. Uh, if you bump up the value even more, you'll, you'll see it more. But orange is being bounced off of this cil cylinder onto the gray uh, ground, adding some orange into that color. Uh, blue is actually being bounced off of this onto the wall over here and onto the ground.
here and, and affecting your lighting. It'll also pick up um, colors and textures. So if you have like a terrain texture or something, it'll actually pick up individual colors from that and uh, bounce accordingly um, based on your indirect uh, lighting intensity. You can also modify this uh, with a post process and the post process volume. Uh, minimum roughness, this actually um, tells it the minimum roughness value to reflect the light on. As I showed you earlier, you can, you can uh, fine tune that in the light itself. Uh, this scales the uh, resolution of the shadow maps used for the shadow in this light. Uh, so it's um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, your shadow bias, um, this controls basically how accurate the self-shadowing of the entire scene shadows from this light are. Um, you can sharpen shadow filtering with this, uh, with this uh, slider here. Uh, contact shadow length, uh, we're going to get into this in a, another part of the video that focuses more on contact shadows. Uh, whether or not you want it to cast a translucent shadow. So if you have, uh, for example, uh, grass in the scene, um, or if you have a sewer grate that's uh, a masked uh, material, then it'll actually cast a shadow based on that opacity. Um, if you have it enabled, uh, this will tell the engine whether or not the light is going to cast shadows from cinematic uh, actors. Um, cinematic actors are basically the ultra high quality in the engine for cinematics that you don't necessarily need to worry about uh, having the best performance for gameplay. Uh, dynamic indirect lighting, this is whether or not it injects itself into light propagation volume, which is one of the features that you have to enable via a configurable any, which we're actually going to go over a little bit later. Whether or not to cast static shadows, whether or not to cast dynamic shadows, whether or not you affect translucent lighting. Um, whether or not to cast a volumetric shadow, uh, which we're actually going to go over uh, volumetrics uh, a little later. So if you go to the, uh, the light mass tab, uh, indirect lighting saturation, this is the saturation of your indirect uh, bounce lighting. Your shadow exponent basically controls the fall off of the shadow penumbra, so how soft this, this is, regardless of what your uh, source radius is. And whether or not to use uh, shadows for stationary light for pre Shadow maps. Um, and under the performance tab, you can adjust the uh, minimum and maximum draw distance. Uh, light function, we're going to go over later. It's basically a dynamic mask for your light, so you can do things like uh, clouds, uh, cloud shadows, and things like that. Uh, light profiles, IES uh, texture, which is basically a non dynamic mask, but it also uh, gives your light specific lighting values based on real world lighting. We're going to get into that later as well. Distance field shadows, uh, this is also going to be in another part of the video. And that pretty much covers it for the uh, point light. So now we're going to move on to the uh, next most common light, which is the spotlight. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the spotlight. So the spotlight is um, uh, another one of the most common uh, light actors in Unreal Engine 4. And it's also the light actor you should be using the most. Um, as I said before, you want to try to avoid point lights, uh, point lights whenever possible, and use spotlights instead. Um, they're less performance intensive, and they also give you uh, greater control most of the time uh, for setting up lighting in your environment. So um, this is a spotlight that's been set to static. Uh, I'm not going to go over the mobility options for this. It's the exact same as the point light. Uh, most of these options are, are the uh, parameters available for the for the uh, spotlight are the same as the point light, so I'm not going to go over those that, uh, that it shares. Um, it does have a few of its own uh, parameters that I will go over. Uh, one of them being the cone angle. So as you can see, you have an inner and outer cone angle. Um, the inner and outer cone angle are represented here by, uh, by these lines, these ray cast lines that uh, are, are in the shape of the cone, obviously. And you can see the uh, spherical or uh, hemisphere fall off at the edge of the cone. So the inner cone is the brightest point of the light. The outer cone uh, represents the edge of the light where uh, and the area in between is the fall off between the brightest and uh, darkest part of the light. As you can see here, with the baked shadows, you can see where it falls off based on the, uh, the cone. So if I go in and adjust the cone, you can see that it uh, updates in real time. If I set this light to movable and then hit build, it's going to get rid of all of the uh, shadow map, all the bake light information. 
get a better idea of uh, how the cones affect the light. You can see as I adjust the outer cone angle and the inner cone angle. If I uh, hide the actor itself, you can see how those are affecting the shadowing. Attenuation radius, um, I already went over it with the point light, but it is uh, sort of important for the spotlight as well. It can also affect the intensity of your light. Um, because the farther you cast, the more intense the light's going to be along the, uh, the cone. So that combined with the effect, how bright your light is when it's hitting the surface. Um, for this, you also have your, uh, your uh, source radius, uh, your soft source radius, and your source length. Source length for the spotlight doesn't actually go along the of the light itself where the cones are, it goes uh, the opposite direction. This is something to keep in mind um, when you're setting up your uh, source length. But this is good if you are, like I said, using this for a uh, fluorescent ceiling light or something that's longer because you wouldn't want it to, uh, the length to go the, the length of the light itself. So the rest of the settings for the spotlight are pretty much identical to the point light. And as I said, this is the most um, inexpensive uh, performance-wise light and entity to render. So this is the one that you should be using for just about anything. If there's a very particular instance where you need to use a point light, then go ahead and do that, but uh, try to avoid it uh, if at all possible. And another thing with the outer cone radius, uh, radius if you slide it, the maximum it's going to go to is 80, but you can actually type in a value beyond that. If you want to go 90, that gives you a full uh, flat outer cone. All right, so that pretty much does it for the uh, spotlight. So the next part of the video is going to cover uh, utilizing the spotlight for uh, bounce card lighting, which is used a lot in architectural visualization. So let's, uh, let's jump into that now. All right, so this is a, another spotlight, and it is also set to uh, static. Its mobility is set to static. So what's going on in this scene is I'm actually using the spotlight to bounce its light off of a light card, and then that bounce light is what's lighting the scene. This is used a lot in architectural visualization to give a much softer lighting and more uh, natural, uh, natural bounce light in the scene. So a lot of times people are doing archviz environments will set these up in like windows and skylights and all that, bounce the light off of them and then delete them and build the scene. Because even if you have the light built, or once you have the light built, even if you delete this, the uh, shadow maps and everything and the bounce lighting all that stays. So if you look at the scene in unlit mode, you can see that this card is blue, the environment is gray, and this pillar is orange. And there's also a sphere over here that's blue as well. If I go into lighting only, which is only showing the lighting values, you can see that the entire scene is being lit up blue because this spotlight is only hitting the blue card and all the light is coming from the bounce values off of that. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is the light color itself will um, affect the bounce light color. So it'll combine whatever color you're bouncing onto it with the color of the surface. So I have it set to white, which is why it's, it's bouncing back in blue. If I go and adjust this value and say I make it a little bit of uh, red, and then I rebuild my lighting, you can see that the blue is kind of toned down a little bit and it's gone uh, more towards a purpley color, as you can see here, or a uh, magenta. If we go back and change the uh, light color to say a uh, blue, like a uh, lighter blue. You also have to remember that your color value, if it's uh, darker, lighter is going to affect the brightness, the overall brightness of your light intensity. So you want to keep your saturation all the way up or, or your brightness all the way up if possible. So I go in and build it again with uh, light blue as the light color. You can see that it's now um, adding the light blue into the blue of the surface and it's making it extremely uh, blue in the scene. Now, if I want to take the, uh, if I go back to unlit, as you can see, this is a, uh, an orange, uh, orangish yellow color material. So if I take that and I put it on this uh, bounce card and then I go back to my light and I change this color back to uh, white. I go back into uh, lighting only and then I hit build. You can see that it's now bouncing orange into the scene. That orangish yellow, the same color that's on here. As you can see that orange is hitting this blue sphere and making it look uh, sort of green. They're giving it a, a green surface color. So the uh, bounce also is basically um, affected by the surface of the mesh. So this is obviously a flat surface, but if I turn the light around and bounce it off of this uh, cylinder, you're going to see the light actually bounces out um, the direction the, uh, the cylinder surface faces. I'm going to turn this light around. I'm going to bounce it off of this cylinder. 
And I'm actually going to bring this sphere over as well, this blue sphere. And I'm going to widen the uh, outer cone angle a little bit. Back. Okay, so now I'm going to build lighting again. Now, as you can see, it's bouncing um, orangish uh, yellow off of this cylinder this way, and it's bouncing blue off of the sphere this way. And it's bouncing away from the, the curvature of the surface. As you can see, when it hits this, this uh, sphere, it's bouncing a little bit of blue onto this, uh, this cylinder. And it's also bouncing a little bit of orange, orangish yellow from the cylinder onto the, uh, onto the sphere. If I go back to this, uh, this bounce card and say add matte gray to it, you can see it's bouncing, it's bouncing a little bit of orange um, onto this matte gray. If I apply the blue back to it, same thing. Now, a few things to keep in mind when you're doing uh, bounce card lighting or any type of bounce lighting. Um, is the attenuation radius of your light, the intensity of your light, and obviously if you're using a spotlight, the uh, cone angles are all going to affect um, how much light bounces. So if I put this uh, back into its uh, setup that I had originally, which I'll do by reloading the scene. So as you can see, this, these were the settings that I had originally. If I take this um, intensity, and let's say I double it, so I go from 8,000 to 16,000, and then I hit rebuild. You can see that the, the, the bounce lighting got much more intense. And you can also obviously adjust the bounce value or indirect lighting intensity of the light itself. So I already went over that with the point light, um, so you can kind of mix those things together and uh, get the, uh, the lighting that you're looking for. And as I said before, you can also adjust uh, light bounce intensity in post. It's basically a post-process effect that um, intensifies the uh, light bounce based on the values you give it. All right, so that pretty much covers uh, bounce card lighting. So the next uh, uh, part of the video that we're going to go into is going to be uh, light functions, and uh, they're going to cover light functions and IES profiles. So let's uh, let's jump into that. All right, so now I'm going to cover um, using light functions. So a light function is basically a uh, dynamic material that uh, can animate your, uh, the way your light is projected. So um, you can do things with this, like uh, having clouds in a large environment that are cloud shadows that pan across your, uh, your environment. Uh, you can use it for things like um, light shining through a window rather than actually um, having it cast shadows from the frame of the window. You can use a, a, a mask in the function. Um, you could have things like a, uh, a, a ceiling fan, for example, that you want to have the, the ceiling fan rotating and blocking the light uh, without actually having to have geometry if you don't uh, see the light itself or if you don't see the uh, fan blades themselves. So it's, uh, it's pretty dynamic and allows you, it's basically a dynamic mask for your light. So I'm going to apply this light function here that I've already created. And as you can see, it's um, masking the light to just these uh, circles that are being repeated over and over. Um, and the material setup is very straightforward for this one. I've literally just got a panner um, that's panning this texture, um, this mask, and that's what's causing it to move. So I can go and do things like adjust the scaling, like this. I'm doing this all via material instance, by the way, for the uh, light function. I can adjust the movement speed. I can also modify the intensity of the mask itself, how much it, uh, it masks the light. Um, and you can go in and make the material as uh, dynamic as you like. Um, I just made this one fairly simple for uh, demonstration purposes. And obviously, it's going to um, uh, be affected by your light settings. So if I go in and change the color to uh, like an orange, for example, you'll see that it's masking the light uh, with the orange color value. If we go in and adjust the outer cone angle, you'll see that it spreads out. Um, that's another thing is the, uh, the mask is going to be relative to the size of your light, uh, so your, your light frustrum, basically. As you can see light falloff still works. It's still affected. Source radius also affects it. Uh, attenuation radius is also affected by it. 
so that pretty much covers um, light functions uh, at a basic level, uh, shows you what they do. And they're applied um, by literally creating a light function material, which you can look up online, um, and preferably making an instance from that and then dragging the instance into here because the instance will allow you to uh, modify the values at runtime. And also if you're doing multiple light functions, uh, you wanna have a single master material. So now we're gonna go into uh, light profiles, um, otherwise known as IES profiles. So what IES profiles are is they're not just masks for your light, um, but they actually give the light values based on real world information. Um, they don't necessarily have to be real world um, information, but a lot of the times, uh, or most use cases, they are for architectural visualization and things like that. So if you're, for example, setting up um, a virtual stage, like a, a, a production stage or something like that, and you want to see how your actual light panels are using for lighting, um, will affect the scene. You can find the IES profiles for that specific light panel and download them. Um, then put them in the engine and use the actual light values for that light. Um, you can also use them for um, things like, uh, you know, very basic masks if you want to. Say if you have a, like a flashlight and you want to get the little uh, projection, uh, light projection pattern that a flashlight has, you can, you can do that as well. So um, I downloaded a bunch of free IES profiles online. Uh, you can do a Google search and find IES profiles uh, all over the place. Um, this is just a batch that I found online. So if I throw an IES profile um, on the light, now as you can see, it changed the, the light. All I did was drag that in there. I didn't change any of the light settings. That's the default that I have set up, and then I drag this in. So as you can see, if you look at the, um, the actual thumbnail for the light, let's zoom in a little bit, it shows you what the light uh, pattern is going to look like. This is basically how the light is going to cast. So you can picture this in three dimensions. Go and drag another uh, profile in there. You can see how it's affecting the light. And uh, they, they work for um, static, stationary, and movable. I'm sorry, uh, stationary and movable. Uh, static is not supported. You'll see that it gets grayed out as soon as you do that. Throw a couple of these in here so you can see the difference in the uh, lighting values. Now, um, these are also uh, affected by the settings for your light. You want to change the color, it's still affected by the IES profile. The uh, outer angle, inner angle, all that stuff is going to be affected by the uh, IES profile. Now, as you can see, when I adjust the outer cone angle and the inner cone angle, if I maximize them out, you'll see that the light's still only casting within that area. So if you maximize these values, you're getting the true uh, values from the IES profile. It's not being masked by your um, inner and outer cone angle values. Back to there. Or, there. Okay, um, so another thing you can do is you can combine uh, light profiles, IES profiles, and uh, light functions. If I go back and apply my function to this light, you can see that within the mask, it's actually uh, still using the IES profile. Now, light uh, IES profiles and light functions also affect volumetric lighting. Uh, which we're going to get to, uh, which we're going to cover in the next part of the video. All right, so now we're going to go over uh, volumetric lighting, which is a newer feature in Unreal Engine 4, and it's something that uh, everybody's been waiting for for a while, including myself. So it currently uh, it, it works very well. Uh, cost overhead or performance overhead is not that intense. Uh, one of the biggest drawbacks to it is it is a screen space effect, and its update rate is... Um, not one-to-one -one with your refresh rate. And you'll see what I mean if I move this light around. Now you can see that it leaves a little bit of trail of the uh, volumetric effect as it moves around. Uh, that's because the update rate of the screen space effect is, uh, is not one-to-one -one with your refresh rate. Uh, that's one of the few drawbacks to it. Um, other than that, it's, uh, it's pretty robust and you can use it for, uh, for some really nice, uh, nice mood lighting. So in order to enable uh, volumetric lighting, uh, you need to have a light that's either uh, stationary, static, or movable. You can set it to any of those. And then in the light itself, back to movable, in the light itself, you want to adjust your volumetric scattering intensity. So by default, it's zero, which means that it's off. Uh, 
And as you slowly slide this up, the maximum value is going to be used four by default, but you can manually type in any value you want. So I've been, I'm using 50 for this example. You can pump it up to 500. It's basically the intensity that this uh, light is going to in inject itself into the uh, volumetric lighting uh, screen space effect. So I'm going to set that uh, back to 50. Now, another thing that you need in order for this to render is um, an exponential height fog uh, actor, which I've already put into the scene. So with the um, exponential height fog actor in the scene, you need to go under the volumetric fog tab and check the volumetric fog checkbox. And under here, you have some, uh, some overall tweaks for the volumetric fog. You have scattering distribution. You have albedo color, which is basically going to be a color that's injected into your volumetric uh, lighting color from each light. Uh, you have an extinction scale, uh, you have a view distance, and uh, statics, uh, static lighting scattering intensity. Um, now, the fog density also affects your uh, volumetric lighting, which is under the exponential height fog components uh, default settings. Uh, your um, interscattering color which is also uh, is basically affecting your, your, your fog the height fall off. All this stuff uh, affects your uh, volumetric lighting. So volumetric lighting is um, available on all light actors from what, um, at least all the point light actors, so the uh, directional light, uh, point light, and spotlight. So you can use it for your, for your sunlight as well, um, as well as spot and point lights. Now, uh, if you want to have the volumetric fog actually shadow itself uh, when it uh, intersects with an actor, as it's doing here, so you can see as I... Um, move past this uh, the cylinder, it's actually blocking the, the volumetric light based on the shadow that's being cast. In order to do that, uh, you need to have the light selected, which I do right now. And you need to enable cast volumetric shadow. So if you have that disabled, the, you'll see now that the cylinder is not actually blocking the volumetric effect. If I have it enabled, you can see that it's blocking it. And that goes the same for any object that you have in front of the uh, volumetric effect. So I move the sphere over here. As you can see, it's blocking the, the volumetric light. So volumetric lighting is uh, affected by um, IES profiles and light functions. Uh, light functions are not as noticeable um, just because of the way it renders, uh, depending on the resolution of the volumetric effect that you're using. So if I have the uh, light selected and I throw a light function on it, the same one I showed you before, um, it does affect the volume, uh, but it's very, very subtle. IES profiles, however, are much more noticeable. So if I go in and put a IES profile on this uh, volumetric light, intensity, you can see how much it actually affects the, uh, the light volume. And obviously your light uh, color is going to affect the color of your um, volumetric light injection. Now, one more feature of uh, volumetric lighting is actually uh, something that's not tied to the light at all. It's a particle system. Now, there is a uh, particle system that you can set up that will only uh, be affected by volumetric lighting. So I already have one set up and I already have it in the environment, so I'm going to show it. Now, as you can see, the uh, particle system is basically intensifying the volumetric effect uh, wherever the volumetric light intersects with it. If I take it and I slide it up, you can see as it goes outside of the volume, it disappears, it comes back inside the volume, makes everything more intense. Now, these, uh, these uh, particle systems for volumetric uh, lighting are useful for things like uh, low-lying fog, or if you have a very specific light setup and you want uh, the volumetric lighting to be more intense um, around like steam coming out of a sewer grate or something like that, you can use it for uh, things like that. Um, and you can place them throughout your environment and have a little bit better control over how your uh, volumetric lighting looks. All right, so that... Uh, 
covers volumetric lighting, um, fundamentals of it, and how to set it up. All right, so the next part of the video is going to cover the skylight actor. So let's uh, let's jump into that part of the video. All right, so now we're going to go over the skylight light actor. So what this actor does is it acts uh, similar to a directional light because it lights your entire environment, but it actually lights your entire environment using a, a color information from a cube map. So you can either have the actor capture your entire scene automatically as a cube map and then project those colors back into your scene as lighting, or you can specify a cube map that you want it to use. So I've currently got the light built. Uh, the skylight actor is set to static, and I've done a light build, and I have it set to captured scene. Uh, so that means it's actually capturing all the color information in my scene and creating its own cube map from it. Um, in order to change between capturing the scene and capturing the, using a cube map, you would uh, expand the light tab and under source type select um, specified cube map or capture. So uh, currently my entire scene just consists of a uh, sky sphere with some clouds and a blue sky. And that's what's being used to light the uh, interior of this room. And I've also got bounce uh, pushed up a little bit to show the effect a little bit better in the video. Now, if I want to change this and I want to go and um, put a cube map in there rather than have it capture my scene, I can do that and show you what, uh, what the difference is. So I'm going to change my source type to SLS specified cube map and then drag a cube map in there. The cube map I'm going to use uh, first is going to be this one. As you can see, it has a lot of browns and reds and magentas and so when I build lighting, the color is going to be dramatically different. So if I go in and build lighting, so as you can see, the entire uh, lighting of the interior of the room is completely different, and it's based on the color information from this uh, this cube map that I just uh, that I just um, fed the properties for the skylight actor. As you can, and I didn't change anything outside of the room; everything still. Looks I'm going to go in again and change this uh, cube map out with another one. This is going to have uh, more of a green, uh, white, and tan uh, overall color to it. And it looks like this. And I'm going to build my lighting again. As you can see, it's changed the lighting completely again based on this, uh, this image. So I'll go through and do two more uh, cube maps to show you the, uh, the differences a little bit more. Build lighting. Now the lighting color information is coming. Last time, I'll swap the cube map out again and then build lighting. So that shows you how much of a difference a change in cube map can make uh, when, when building your skylight. Um, and if you have it set to capture uh, capture world, or capture scene instead, it's going to use, um, as I said before, all the color information that's actually in your scene. So if you want realistic lighting for what's already in your scene and you want it to look like uh, you have distant mountains, so uh, they're casting light into your, uh, into your environment, um, you can do that as well. So the options down here um, that are available for the uh, Skylight Actor, um, these allow you to uh, rotate the cube map. When your source type is set to uh, specified cube maps, you can actually rotate it around. So if your source of uh, light, for example, uh, you want it to come from the other direction, then you would rotate the light. And then in your cube map, you have the sun captured over in this area. You can uh, line them up if you want to. Cube map resolution. This is going to be the maximum resolution um, when it takes that cube map and injects the colors back into your scene. So you can get uh, more uh, defined uh, color information in your uh, light projection, or in your uh, image-based light projection. Sky distance threshold, this is how far um, that it'll actually search when it's creating the cube map from your scene, when you do a uh, scene capture. The intensity is uh, self-explanatory. It's how bright the light is, um, basically the exposure of this cube map or the, the captured scene. Um, light color, you can go in and modify the uh, color of the light overall, and then when you bake, it's going to be a tint. Uh, it's going to tint your uh, your cube map accordingly. Whether or not it affects world, whether or not it casts shadows, your indirect lighting intensity, um, capture emissive only. So. This, if, if you have this checked, it's only going to, and if you have this checked and then you have um, capture scene uh, selected as your source type, then it's only going to 
put emissive objects into that queue that are going to capture the noise and then leave the noise. Um, whether or not you want the uh, lower hemisphere to be a solid color, and if it is a solid color, what color that's going to be. Um, a lot of, usually, the reason you want to use this is so you don't get, um, if you have a spherical cube map and the entire thing has color in it, uh, the lighting's not going to look like it's coming from above the whole time. It's going to look like you have something from the bottom and all that. That can kind of create some unwanted uh, visual appearance. Um, whether or not you want it to cast static shadows, dynamic shadows, um, whether or not you want it to affect translucent lighting or cast volumetric shadows. So most of these are um, represented in other light actors as well, other than the uh, stuff having to do with the hemisphere and the actual environment. Um, and now under here, so if you go to the Skylight tab, you have a Recapture Scene button, and it just says Recapture. And if you click on that, it's going to recapture your entire scene if you have it set to Capture Scene. So if you change things in your scene and um, you know quite drastically, and you want it to be uh, updated in your Skylight Actor, if you're doing a capture scene, then you want to click that, or else it's just going to use the last uh, capture that it did. All right, so that uh, that pretty much covers the Skylight Actor. So the uh, next part of this video is going to cover um, fully dynamic lighting. Uh, so let's jump into that now. Okay, so in this section of the video, I'm going to cover um, some of the, the uh, full dynamic uh, lighting techniques available in Unreal Engine 4. So there currently isn't a, a great real-time global illumination system in Unreal Engine 4, but it does have something called light propagation volume, which is a, it's basically a voxelized, um, pre-calculated indirect lighting solution. It's not enabled by default. You have to enable it via uh, modifying an any, which I will go through after showing you um, a couple things uh, before we, en we enable it. So uh, right now I have a static uh, directional light. Now the reason I have it set to static and we're going over dynamic lighting is because there, uh, there, there's some uh, dynamic lighting features that actually work in conjunction with static lighting. So um, one of the latest features that utilizes this is something called distance field indirect shadow. So what this does is it basically uses the uh, bounce light direction of a pre-baked light to cast uh, soft shadows on dynamic, uh, from dynamic objects. So as you can see, this cylinder is uh, currently set to uh, movable, so it's completely dynamic. So if I move it around the scene, you can see that the shadow is already being cast. Um, it's a soft shadow. If I move this over here, you'll see as it gets closer to the surface, it's actually casting a, um, a soft shadow onto that surface. Now, as you can see, the, uh, the direction of the shadow is the direction that the uh, bounce light is coming from. So this light is pointing down at this angle, as you can tell by the shadow, and the light is bouncing off um, in the opposite direction at the same, uh, same opposite angle. So as I move this closer to this wall, as you can see, it's casting a shadow, it gets closer, it gets darker, and uh, the shadow is actually very high quality. And this is a screen space effect that uses uh, distance fields in conjunction with uh, light bounce. So if I do the same thing and I move this over to this side, now watch the shadow from the cylinder. You'll see what happens with it. See how it's moving to the other direction now? So now it's casting against this wall. Um, that's because the indirect lighting within the shadow is actually bouncing the opposite direction. It's basically going the direction that this uh, shadow is being cast, but in reverse. So the shadow is actually being cast from the direction of the indirect bounce. That's something to keep in mind when utilizing this, uh, this rendering feature. As you can see, as I uh, move it around, it's uh, crawling along the wall based on the indirect lighting bounce uh, control. And this also affects um, other movable objects. So if I slide this uh, sphere in front of it, you can see it's, uh, the shadow is casting onto it. Um, this sphere also has uh, this feature enabled, so you can see what the shadow from this looks like. All right, so in order to enable um, this uh, rendering feature, you want to have your uh, mesh selected. You want to open its lighting tab, um, and the mesh needs to be set to uh, stationary or movable. If you set it to static, it's not going to work, as you can see here. 
And then under its lighting tab, you want to um, hit the little, uh, looks like a downward eject button. Let's click on that, it shows more options. And then you want to check this little box that says uh, distance field indirect shadow. If I uncheck it, you'll see what uh, the shadow's gone. If I check it again, you'll see the type of shadow. It also self shadows um, using, that, uh, using that rendering feature. And obviously you need to have cast shadow enabled. You can also modify the uh, minimum uh, visibility for uh, distance field indirect shadows. And that's pretty much it for, um, for that uh, rendering feature, which as I said was added, I believe it was in 4.18, possibly 4.17. So it's a very, uh, it's a very new feature that was, uh, that was added. Now in order for this to work, you also need to make sure that your static mesh has its distance fields uh, built. So you can either do this by um, going into edit project settings, um, going under the uh, rendering tab, which is under the engine, uh, engine header, and then going to lighting and checking generate distance fields and restarting the editor. It's going if to, if you do this, it's going to generate distance fields for all the assets in your, uh, in your project. Or you can do it per object if you only need it for a few by um, opening the mesh itself, or the mesh properties itself, which you can either do by clicking the thumbnail um, in the static mesh uh, details, or you can double click it in your um, content browser. You can even right click on it and go to edit uh, whatever your mesh is. And then in its, um, in its properties, if you go under general settings and check generate uh, mesh distance field and hit save, it'll generate the distance field for it. So you have to have that uh, distance field generated for the object that's gonna be casting the shadows or else it won't work because it utilizes uh, distance fields uh, to cast a shadow. All right, so now I'm going to go into um, light propagation volumes. So light propagation volumes, um, you have a setting for it on every light type. The only light type that it seems to work for, at least for me, is the uh, directional light. So the directional light is a, it's basically the light you use um, to replicate sunlight. So it's an infinite, uh, light casting entity, it'll cast infinitely. It's not just coming from a single point, it's gonna cast infinitely in, infinitely in whatever direction um, you set it up to, to cast in. And it's got the same values as point and spotlight for the most part. Um, uh, it's obviously missing cone angle and things like that, but everything else is the same. So this is the entity that you would use to light an entire um, outdoor environment. And you can also um, up its bounce settings. If you do have an indoor environment that's getting, it's supposed to get it, its light from sunlight only, you can up its bounce, uh, bounce values and have you know openings where the light's supposed to come through. And if you set up your angle and bounce and all the stuff correctly, you can get really uh, organic uh, exterior lighting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to enable light propagation volumes, or at least show you how to do it because I already have it enabled. So in order to enable light propagation uh, volumes, you actually have to, um, you can't do it through your console, otherwise known as the output log, um, but you can type the value in if you want. So it's um, R dot light propagation volume, capitalizing each word um, uh, in light propagation volume and hit enter. As you can see, it says equals one. Uh, by default, it's gonna say zero. So that means it's not enabled. So you can't just go into the console and type it. You have to modify an any file and then restart the editor. So in order to modify the any file, you would go to your um, Unreal Engine, uh, engine, and then config directory. So mine's in D program files, Epic Games, uh, UE 4.18s, whatever engine version is, um, forward slash engine, forward slash config. So you're gonna look for an any file, console variables uh, uh, .any. So you can open it with Notepad if you like. I personally prefer to use a Notepad, uh, Notepad++. So I'm gonna do that. So once you have it open, you'll see all the screen text. Um, everything from here up is the uh, are the default values for this. Uh, this any file. Um, as you can see, I added the value here um, at the very bottom without a semicolon. If you have the semicolon, it's commenting it out, so it won't. Uh, it'll just uh, ignore it. So r dot light propagation volume uh, space equals space one, and you have to type it exactly like it's typed here. And once you do that, you just save the file. And then um, if the editor isn't open already, then you can just launch the editor. If it is open, you have to close it down and restart it for it to, uh, to get that, uh, to get that variable, uh, variable pass through. So I'm gonna go in and set my directional light to movable. And since I already have light propagation volumes enabled, you'll see that it's already uh, doing its job and I'm getting real-time uh, global illumination, uh, voxelized uh, real-time global illumination. So if I go in and rotate the light around, 
can see that my shadow maps are still there because I had it set as static and I built lighting. So what I'm going to do is actually build lighting real quick to get rid of those shadow maps. So whenever you have a light that was static, you built lighting, and you want to change it to dynamic, uh, you just rebuild lighting and it'll get rid of those, uh, those shadow maps from that light. So now it's going to be more apparent just what's going on. So as you can see, as I rotate the light around, it's getting real-time bounce. So you'll notice that the pillar is uh, an orange or yellow color, and it's bouncing that color into the environment as I rotate the light. So I keep the light right here. You can see the ground. Now you'll see if I move the light really quickly, it'll take it a second for it to, uh, to catch up, for the light propagation uh, volume to catch up, because once again, this is also a uh, screen space effect. As you can see, if I shine it completely outside of, uh, out of the box, there's no bounce going on whatsoever. If I hit just a little bit, you'll see it slowly becomes brighter in the scene. As I said before, this is all completely dynamic. Um, so you can use this for uh, dynamic um, day-night cycles for outdoor lighting. Uh, you can use it for indoor lighting where everything else is static, and then you have this shining in through the windows if you like. Um, you can kind of play around with it and get, uh, you know, get the, uh, the effect that you're looking for. And it's obviously still affected by your light's um, intensity, uh, the light color, um, indirect lighting intensity. Right, so we're also going to cover, um, before I leave this, uh, this environment set up, I'm going to set my light back to uh, stationary. I'm going to build my lighting. So um, I just built my lighting with the light set to stationary. Um, now, as you can see, the shadows are actually uh, fairly soft. They have a nice uh, number that falls off towards the edge. I'm using something called uh, distance field uh, shadows, which is another feature that's actually... Um, I believe it's only available on directional light, but I may be wrong. Uh, so if you have it set to static and you go under distance field shadows and you check this ray trace distance field shadows, it will build with your light. And then you have these uh, values here which you can modify it with. Um, once again, to do this, you have to have uh, your uh, mesh distance fields uh, built. I'm going to uncheck this, and then you can see what the light looks like by default. These are just the uh, shadow maps. If I enable it again, you can see how it softens up around the if I go in and modify these values, you can see how the numbers are affected. You have to rebuild lighting, so I'm going to do that real quick. So you can see the difference without it and then with it on. So it basically um, adds a soft shadow around your hard shadow uh, light maps. Now, um, as you can see, when I switch it to movable, um, it doesn't show anymore. So with all of my uh, experimentation, it only seems to work with the light set to stationary. And we're going to cover uh, one more thing while I'm here since we're covering the uh, directional light, and that is uh, light shafts. So light shafts um, are basically a more, uh, not really uh, an, an older version of uh, volumetric lighting, but it, it, it's... It was kind of what, uh, what they used to use uh, before they had volumetric lighting. Um, there's not a huge need for it right now um, in most, most use cases, but you still may want to use it here and there. Basically what it does is it casts a, um, and it's only available on directional lights, by the way. Um, it's not available on any of the uh, point lights. So what it does is it uh, casts uh, something similar to volumetric lighting, um, but it's a uh, god rays, um, light shafts around objects. So an object is going to occlude uh, the light shafts, it, uh, it occludes the light shaft. You can see it more if I move the camera around. So with uh, the light shafts enabled, so in order to, to uh, enable light shafts, you go into the light shafts tab and you um, check this light shaft occlusion box and then you modify these settings. Uh, light shaft bloom is actually uh, bloom on the light shaft itself. So you can go through and uh, tweak these values. You have occlusion mass darkness, which is how dark the dark area is. Occlusion uh, depth range, which is how far the um, occlusion is actually happening. Uh, your bloom scale, the intensity of the bloom on the light shafts. And your bloom threshold, which basically brings this back down as you're moving around. You can also adjust the bloom tint, uh, the tint of your light shafts. 
And you can override the direction of the light chassis. So if your light's facing one way, but you want the light chassis to come from another direction for whatever reason, you can modify that there. And uh, once again, um, with directional lights, you can use light functions, as I said before. So I apply this here. And as you can see, it's affecting the uh, entire environment. So if I take this uh, cube, for example, and I scale it up, you see that it's affecting the entire environment. So um, you can see here that it would be very useful for things, um, for directional light, for something like uh, shadows from clouds that move across the environment, uh, things like that. And the, the uh, light functions also still work in conjunction with um, uh, light propagation volumes, the full dynamic uh, voxelized GI. It doesn't mask it, but uh, it still, still works in there. So another um, dynamic lighting technique that was recently added in a, a, a version of Unreal Engine, I believe it was 416, 417, somewhere around there, um, is uh, the ability to have contact shadows. So what contact shadows are is their screen space effect it gives you a more detailed shadow um, where a surface is very close to another surface. So if you have things like uh, grass um, or moss or a vine crawling up a wall, you, uh, you want to have a more detailed shadow where it intersects and not just a, a blob shadow. And it even affects characters, things like uh, the nose casting a shadow onto the face, things like that are going to be much, uh, much higher quality with this effect enabled. So in order to enable your uh, directional uh, or whatever light source you're using has to be set to movable. Um, you can set it on, you can enable on static or stationary, but as soon as you build lighting, it, uh, the rest of the effect goes away. So you have your light selected, you go to the light tab, and you'll see uh, contact shadow length. So by default, this is going to be set to zero. And you can see here, this is what it looks like without, uh, without the effect enabled. If I slowly scale this up, you'll see the shadows start to, uh, start to render. So I'm using a value of 0 0.01, sorry, 0.1. One for this example, and as you can see, um, this this uh, masked uh, material is very close to the surface of the cylinder, and it's casting uh, more detailed shadows. Same thing is going on down here. So I set this uh, cast shadow or contact shadow length back to zero. You can see the difference. So if you want very crisp, uh, detailed shadows where surfaces are close to other surfaces, um, and I just mentioned some use cases. Um, then this is uh, what you want to use. And uh, they can add, uh, actually add a lot of uh, visual quality to your scene. You have it enabled in uh, larger environments. And it obviously fades out at distance. Um, it is a screen space effect, so it's not going to be rendering all the time in the entire scene, which you wouldn't want anyway. But when you get closer to an object, um, and you can see the uh, where it's supposed to cast a shadow onto the surface, it's going to look a lot more realistic uh, if you have this enabled. All right, so that covers uh, fully dynamic lighting and the directional light. So let's move on to the next one, which is um, static mesh emissive lighting. So we'll jump into that now. OK, so this part of the video is going to cover um, lighting a scene using an emissive material on a static mesh. So there are actually no light actors in this scene. Um, as you can see, if I select this pillar, I don't have game mode on, so it's not hiding any of the actors. So the light in the scene is completely being generated by these uh, these four meshes that have an emissive material on them. So I'm using two, um, actually three different materials. As you can see, I have emissive white on this one, which is a pure white uh, emissive material. I have emissive blue, which is a, uh, a very bright blue. And then I have this material, which is um, an emissive texture where I just have an RGB bar. And that same material is being used on the sphere over here. So as you can see, if I go into uh, lighting only, um, the meshes themselves are not receiving light. They're just casting it from the uh, emissive material. Or they are, I'm sorry, they are receiving light. It's just, uh, it's very subtle because it's, it's emitting from its surface. So it's getting some bounce light. It's not actually receiving direct lighting. Um, so if I go back into unlit mode, you can see what the surfaces look like. So this is like a purplish blue because it's, it's, uh, the emissive value is so high, it's, it's starting to become white. Um, this is an RGB uh, bar material. Same thing with this. And if I go back into lit mode, you can see exactly how the, uh, the light is being emitted into the world. So you don't have control over this type of lighting like you do with point lights. Uh, you, you can't control like uh, attenuation radius, fall off, things like that. It's all um, done through the material itself. 
So how intense your, emiss, uh, your emissive uh, value is, is how far it's going to project. Um, the shape of the object affects the lighting, things like that. So you can use this for some uh, very cool lighting effects. And as you can see, it creates a very, very soft light. Much softer than uh, most point lights unless you use a, um, like a high source radius. As you can see, the fall off is, is right along the edge of the object as well. Since a sphere is emitting light from all sides, you can see it's more intense the closer it gets to a surface. So, so if I go in and I, uh, let's say I del get rid of all of these except for one, and you can see that the lighting values are still there because uh, the light was baked. Let's say I rebuild the lighting with just this, uh, this white uh, card. So as you can see, it's, um, it's an extremely soft uh, light that's coming from this because the surface is so, uh, so large. If I scale this down, and then build lighting again, you'll see how it affects um, how it affects the light build. So even though I haven't changed the emissive value or um, uh, the emissive intensity or anything like that, because the surface is smaller, it's not going to put as much light into the scene, as you can see here. So if you look closely, it is illuminating the floor a little bit. Um, but it's very subtle because the surface of the uh, area is so small. I scale it up a little bit more, not quite as big as it was uh, previously, but bigger than um, the smallest value I used. You'll see how it affects the lighting. So you can see it's much brighter, but it's not as bright as it was uh, before I scaled it. So I'm going to reload the map, put it back to its default values. I'm going to delete these again, these three. Um, and then I'm going to modify the emissive value of this. I'm going to build lighting real quick. Okay, so these are the values that I currently have set in the material itself. So in the material, I'm actually, um, I have my emissive intensity set to 1. I'm actually going to set it to 0.5. So it's going to be half of that, uh, that emissive value. So then we're going to go in and rebuild my lighting again. As you can see, with half the emissive value, it's, uh, it's much darker and seems putting out uh, less light, even though I don't change the size of the surface. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is this only works with uh, static, uh, static light fields. At the moment. You cannot use emissive uh, material lighting from meshes for dynamic lights or for full uh, dynamic scenes. And it also does not um, affect movable objects. If I set this little sphere to static and then rebuild lighting, it will get lighting uh, just like everything else. I'm going to reload the scene one more time. So now I'm going to move this sphere um, over into the center so you can see um, how, it, how it changes as I move it. Let's say I make it a little larger. And then I build lighting. Now remember, this, uh, the material in the sphere is a, a bright blue material. So since I made it larger, um, the light uh, emission from it is much more intense. And um, as you can see, it's, it's bouncing blue onto this orange. Reload the map again. So let's say I take out all of these. Or actually, not. I'm going to take out these. I'm going to keep this card here. And I'm going to uh, bring it up higher. Rotate a little bit. And I'm going to scale it up. Then I'm going to go bake light again. So now, as you can see, it's um, it's lighting basically the entire uh, small environment here. It's got very soft uh, light bounce. It's based on the size of the surface, and it's injecting all the colors from this uh, this is this material into the environment. Now, if I scale this um, vertically or horizontally only, and then rebuild lighting, um, pay attention to the shadow that it casts from the cylinder. So as you can see, the lighting is less intense because it's uh, less surface area, once again, and the shadow from the cylinder is more noticeable uh, because the uh, size of the surface behind it casting the shadow, just like the source radius on point lights, is uh, smaller. Now, in order to enable uh, static mesh uh, emissive lighting, you need to have the mesh selected um, and go into its lighting properties and go into light mass settings. 
And then you want to check this box that says using missive for static lighting. And then obviously your mesh itself has to be set to uh, static. So once you do that, um, your emissive values from your material, uh, material will uh, inject into the scene. Now you also have to have your material set up in a specific way for it to uh, emit light into the scene. So I'm going to open the uh, master material for my instance. So in order for it to work, you can use all the default settings. Uh, the only thing that you do need to have is obviously um, an emissive, uh, an emissive uh, node tree set up. So you plug whatever your emissive uh, node tree is into your, the emissive node of your um, root node for the material. So mine is, is uh, pretty straightforward. It gives me a little bit of um, uh, ability to modify the material. So I've got to switch whether or not to use a mask. So if I don't use the mask, it's just using an overall color. That's how I'm getting the colors here. With the mask enabled, I'm getting these RGB uh, colors here. Um, and the mask is basically a texture. So um, I also have that both of those values, the emissive color and the emissive texture uh, mask, um, multiplied by an emissive intensity. So this is basically is, is how intense the emissive value is. Um, so if you don't have a multiplier for your intensity, then you have to literally, if you want a specific color, you have to scroll each color value up um, in relation to each other to get that emissive intensity rather than just having a single value for overall intensity. Once you have all that set up, um, you have your mesh set to static, and you uh, check this using missive for static lighting under the lighting and light mass settings tab of your mesh. Um, and you go to build lighting, you're going to uh, get your uh, emissive light values. So um, in a real world use cases, something this would be good, good for is like if you have a, uh, a material for a sci-fi sci wall that has little light fixtures in the material um, and you want them, you know, they don't move or anything, they don't change color and you want them to inject into the world rather than having to place a point light at each one, you could do that. Um, you could have little uh, uh, backlighting underneath staircases, uh, things like that. Um, it works well for And another thing to keep in mind with static mesh lighting is it does not, um, at least from what I can tell, it does not uh, uh, do any indirect lighting. So it won't bounce off of a surface and then uh, go back into the environment. Um, it's just a, a direct lighting only. All right, so that covers uh, static mesh emissive lighting. Uh, the next uh, part of the video is going to cover uh, modulate lighting. So let's, uh, let's jump into that now. All right, so this scene has a modulated uh, material uh, setup, which means uh, when the light passes through this material, it's going to pick up its color values and project them into its, uh, basically, its shadow map. So this is an entire, uh, entirely static um, uh, lighting feature. It does not work with dynamic or stationary lights. Um, and in order to uh, use this feature, you need to first set up your material to support it. In order to do that, you have, uh, you have your root node of your material. You have an emissive color, which is your texture. Um, this emissive color is what is going to uh, be the color that's picked up um, by the light as it passes through it. So you want to, in your uh, main material tab for the root node, you want to have your material domain set to surface, your blend mode set to modulate, and your shading model set to unlit. Um, and two-sided, I don't believe it's necessary, but you may have to have two-sided enabled for the material. So once you have all that set up, then everything should work. So you just uh, go and build your lighting. Um, obviously, you want to apply your material to whatever surface is going to have the, the uh, that you want to have the light values picked up from as it's cast through by the light, and then you just build your lighting. Um, so obviously, uh, as you can see, I've already built the lighting in the scene. If I go through and I uh, rotate the light actor to a different angle, it's going to cast in this direction now, and I hit build. You can see that it's, um, it's projecting in the direction of the light. Now, another cool thing about it is if you look through the light, or if you look through the uh, surface that the light is uh, modulating through, you can see that the um, light rays from the directional light the uh, light shafts are actually picking up the color values as they pass through the, uh, the material. 
So one of the most obvious use cases for this is what I have here, which is a stained glass window. So this is obviously a very cool technique for, um, for things like the obvious, which would be um, stained glass windows. Uh, you could just have uh, you know regular windows or uh, I don't know, rice paper that uh, light passes through. Anything that would pick up uh, that the light would pick up colors while passing through, and that remains static, you could use this for. All right, so that covers that. Um, the next part we're going to jump into is post processing for uh, for lighting. Okay, so this scene is set up with a bunch of uh, post processing features uh, for lighting specifically enabled. So as you can see, I've got uh, lens flares, which get more intense the closer you get to a surface. Um, I've also got screen dirt, um, which actually is not enabled at the moment. So I'll go ahead and turn that on. Exaggerate it so you can see it a little better. So I've got lens flares, I've got screen dirt, um, I've got bloom, I've also got depth of field. If I pull out, you can see the depth of field in effect. So I'm going to break down how each of these work and how to set them up in your post-process post volume. So um, post-process volume, you can add from your modes tab under the place, uh, place tab here. And you can literally just type in post or go under uh, you know, the classes menu for it and drag and drop it into your scene. So by default, the uh, post-process volume will only affect um, uh, your view when you go inside of it. Um, but if you go into post-process volume settings and click this box for infinite extent, um, then that means it'll affect everything in the scene. So you can see if I uncheck that and the volume is actually here, you see that there's no effect. But if I go inside the volume, you see that the, it's, it's affecting, uh, affecting my view. If I go back outside of it, it's off again. So I'm going to check that. And it's basically it'll affect, you, uh, affect your view anywhere in the environment. You can have post-process volumes inside of that uh, inside of your environment that once you walk into them, they affect your screen separately um, by setting their priority. So let's go into the, uh, the settings that I have in this post-processing volume that specifically have to do with light. So um, chromatic aberration doesn't directly affect light, but it is something that um, can affect the overall look of your environment, which I'm kind of putting in with lighting. So chromatic aberration, what it does, if I adjust the, volume, uh, adjust the value here, if I set it to a higher value like 5 or 10, what it's doing is it's basically separating the red, green, and blue values in the entire scene and giving kind of a stereoscopy effect. And if you do it on a very small level, it can um, kind of remove the really crisp transitions between objects, not where they intersect, but just visually in the world. So if you use a value of 0, it's completely off. If you use a value of 0.25 or 0.5, it's very subtle. But when you're actually playing uh, playing a game at uh, you know, normal movement speed and all that, it's a, it definitely makes a difference. It's more on a subconscious level. Another thing that I have enabled right now is vignette. Vignette is your corner-to-corner -corner, uh, gradient. As you can see, it darkens up, starting at the corners, moving in towards the center. You could use this um, at runtime for things like a blinking eyeball if you wanted to um, by using higher values. I'm using 0.25 for this example. Um, you also have bloom, obviously. So I'm using um, the method uh, set to convolution, which um, is the... It's intended for cinematics. It's the highest quality, but I'm using it for this uh, demonstration purpose because it is the best looking. You can obviously use standard as well, um, but I'm going to keep it on convolution. Um, your intensity, um, if you have it set to convolution, it's not going to be adjustable. If you have it set to standard, you can adjust the intensity. Back to convolution. Uh, your convolution kernel is basically the, um, it's, it's, kind of, it's basically the shape of the uh, the bloom. So if I go in and add, let's say I add a bokeh kernel to it, um, you can see that it's extremely intense. So you, you'd have to set up a material specifically for it, or a texture specifically for it, but you can modify the kernel. Um, and then you can also go in and adjust all these convolution settings. All the other settings are for standard bloom. But uh, your convolution scale, which is basically your intensity for uh, convolution, 
Convolution Center. Convolution Boost. Your minimum and maximum convolution uh, uh, boost settings. Your convolution Boost Multiplier. And your Convolution Buffer. So Dirt Mask, uh, which I just mentioned a little earlier in the video. So this is, you see those little specks that are showing up on the screen as the light uh, lens flares are intersecting with your screen. That's what the uh, Dirt Mask is. So uh, the first time I remember actually seeing this in a game was probably know, Battlefield 3, where it was really used uh, well. Um, and this is based on a texture that you give it. So if I put in another, uh, another texture, like this uh, circular lens flare, you can see that it's only... Uh, rendering that mask where the lens flare intersects with the surface within that masked area. Do the same thing with an anamorphic lens flare. Or a uh, render clouds. So I'm going to go back to the screen dirt uh, mask that I actually set up for this. If I double click, you can see what that looks like. So basically what it's doing is whenever the lens flare intersects with um, any part of the screen, that area of the lens flare is going to be masked by this and, and kind of render this texture a little bit. So it gives you a much more realistic, like you have little specks on the lenses uh, type of look. Um, dirt mask intensity, self-explanatory, it's how intense the dirt mask is. You can adjust the dirt mask tint as well. And yeah, if you utilize a dirt mask in um, conjunction with lens flares, which you need for the dirt mask to render. So if I set the lens flares intensity down to zero, you see the dirt mask does not render at all. So you need to have lens flares enabled. Um, auto exposure, this is your um, eye adaptation, uh, high dynamic range. So it's basically, um, by modifying all these values, which I'm not gonna go into in detail right now, you can adjust how long it takes um, for your um, eye to adapt from a dark area to a light area, um, and how uh, wide of a spectrum you have between dark and light, like what's the brightest and darkest values you, you're gonna adjust for. And you can also change the mode between uh, auto exposure histogram and auto exposure basic. Um, lens flares, so as I touched on earlier, lens flares are what you see going on here, the actual uh, flares from the colors coming in. Now, they don't come off of lights themselves. They come off of the bloom value. So you see, if I set the bloom intensity to zero, the lens flares don't exist. If I slowly bump it up, you'll see that they, uh, it gets more intense, uh, the lens flares do. Set this back to convolution. If I modify the intensity of the lens flares, obviously it's doing uh, what it's supposed to do. I can also go in and uh, adjust the tint color of the lens flares. So that could come in handy if you have, uh, say, like a light source that's one color, but it's going through fog that's another color and using it in conjunction with like uh, volumetric lighting and you want it to match, uh, you could uh, pull some really cool effects. Uh, bokeh size is basically the, the scale of the... Um, it's basically how you're blurring the lens flares. Um, threshold is a, is a modifier of that. Okay, shape, you can actually assign a texture to it. So if I assign the uh, screen uh, dirt texture to it, you can see it's kind of being masked by that. Um, if I assign an actual bokeh texture to it, which is what you're supposed to do, then you can see that it's actually, um, the lens flares are molded to that shape. If you tweak your bokeh size, you can get some realistic effects. So if I drop the intensity down, if I want a more realistic um, uh, intensity, I'll probably do like a 0.1 or something like that, and then probably uh, drop down my dirt mask intensity to 10 or something like that. As you can see, the color of the uh, dirt mask and lens flares and all that are based on the bloom values in the scene. Also, whatever tints you have set up for them. If your tint set to white, it's just going to be whatever color is uh, being emitted by the bloom. 
So depth of field, as I said, I also have that enabled. So if I pull back, you'll see that uh, objects in the distance become uh, much more blurry. And if I come in, uh, they become uh, more crisp and, and uh, clear. So I prefer using Gaussian depth of field. Um, bouquet depth of field was the, uh, I believe, is the cheapest to render. Um, actually, maybe the second cheapest. I think Gaussian is the cheapest. And circle depth of field, I believe, is the, supposed to be the highest end. Um, I personally prefer Gaussian depth of field just because it, it, it seems to give you the most control. So you can set your uh, focal uh, distance, for example, just how far, what your center focus point is for your depth of field. Um, you have your near focal region, um, sorry, your focal region, which is you have that center point, which let's say is a thousand, uh, thousand, thousand units away. Your focal region is going to be from that center point, how many units out it goes in all directions uh, from the distance of the camera. So I pull back a little bit towards some actual blurry. And I scale this up, you can see that the, the region um, inside which everything is, is clear it becomes uh, bigger or smaller based on how I scale that. Uh, your near, near transition region is basically um, how far from the camera it starts to transition into your near uh, blur size, which right now the near blur size set to zero. But if I move in here a little bit and I scale that near blur size up, you'll see it's actually blurring towards the camera or closer to the camera. So it's basically your, your near uh, depth of field and your far depth of field, then you have a focal region inside those values. For most use cases, you're probably going to want to set your near blur size to zero. And then your, your far blur size is the maximum uh, scale that your blur uh, gets at distance. So I scale it up, you see it becomes a lot more blurry. I scale it down, it's, it's not as much blurry. And then another thing that you can go in and adjust with your post-process volume that has to do with uh, lighting is your um, global illumination. So this is the modifier I was talking about earlier where you have a global illumination or indirect lighting intensity on your light, but you can also adjust it um, with a post-process effect um, in the post-process volume. So right now it's set to a one, which is the default. If I slide this up, you'll see this, the bounce intensity becomes uh, more intense. It doesn't actually require rebuilt lighting because it's just uh, doing it in screen space because it is a post-process effect but you can go in and modify it this way. You can also adjust your indirect lighting tint. And once again, this is not changing the light itself, this is just ch changing the way it's rendered on the screen. Uh, your light propagation volume. Uh, so if you have light propagation volume enabled, like I showed you in the other scene, you have all the values here that you can modify in post as well. Ambient occlusion, um, this um, is also uh, part of your, your lighting setup. So ambient occlusion is obviously the area where objects intersect, and it's kind of like a, um, a soft shadow uh, for intersection. You can adjust the intensity, you can adjust the radius, which is basically the distance that your uh, ambient occlusion um, goes out from the area where objects intersect. You can also go in and um, adjust more advanced settings, uh, which are all self-explanatory as well. Power is probably the most useful. So on top of intensity, you can adjust the power. Um, that pretty much covers everything to do with lighting in the uh, post-process uh, volume. Now we're gonna go into the final part of the video, which will cover one of the most important parts of your lighting setup, which is your uh, light maps. So let's get to that now. Okay, so in this, uh, the final part of the video, I'm going to cover, um, as I said before, one of the most important parts of your lighting setup, which is your, uh, uh, which are your light maps. So what light maps look like are this. The light maps basically control the resolution um, of the light as it hits your surface on a per object basis. You can also modify this by adjusting your overall light map scale, but it's still going to be uh, based on your light map scale. So as you see here, um, I have my light maps uh, scaled uh, pretty, uh, pretty high and the density is really high, but they're still rendered as green. If you uh, modify your light map, you can actually do it um, per object by going under the uh, lighting tab and overriding your uh, light map resolution. So if I scale it here, you can see how the light map density changes. 
So blue is going to be the uh, most um, uh, most optimized. It's going to be the least performance intensive. It's going to create the less performance overhead, or the least performance overhead. Um, green is uh, kind of in the middle. And if you start getting into orange and red and all that stuff, it's going to require a lot more time to compute when you actually do bake lighting. And it's also going to uh, generate higher uh, quality shadow maps and, and light maps and all that stuff. So your your file size is going to be bigger and your uh, rendering overhead is going to be uh, more intense. Let's set this back to its default value. I'm going to uncheck this. Now, if you want to um, change your light map uh, density or, or your uh, light map uh, resolution on all the objects for a specific asset, you can do that by going to the asset itself. So once again, either having it in the content browser, double clicking it here, or right clicking it here and doing edit, or right clicking it here and doing edit. There are many ways to get to the editor. So you double click uh, the asset, which I'm doing here. And under here, you can adjust your light map resolution. And once again, you can preview this in real time. So as I scale it up and down, you'll see it changing there. And if I have multiple instances of this in the environment, it's obviously going to uh, change the light up. Because I'm doing it on, a, uh, on an asset level rather than a, uh, an instance level. So um, if I make a duplicate of this here, and I go in and change it for just this one, you can see it's only affecting that asset even though you should both the same. So um, one thing that I usually like to do, uh, depending on the quality of light, uh, 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 static uh, bake lighting uh, that I'm looking for, um, and depending on the object itself, is I like to go in and kind of match up my um, light map density. So light map density is going to be based on your uh, light map UV uh, size and, and density and all that good stuff. So a light map value of 64 for the sphere might not be the same light map density or um, uh, color value when you're previewing it as it would be for the cylinder, simply because they have two different uh, UVs and the sphere uh, would probably end up um, having a higher uh, light map density by default because it's going to take up less UV space. And stuff like that. So it's really based on the object itself. So as you'll see in this scene, I have everything is set to uh, green, so I've kind of modified all of my light map densities to, um, to match up in the scene. So you can see like this cylinder I have set to 128, this sphere I have set to 64, and the entire uh, cube, uh, hollowed out cube for the environment, I have set to 1024. So you can see that each, um, each one required a different light map scale to uh, match up in the world. Another re uh, one of the reasons you want to do this is when you go to build lighting, which I'm going to do now, you'll notice that the lighting resolution on every object is consistent throughout the environment. So if I had a uh, different, um, light map resolution for, say, this cube, um, or, or different light map density for this cube, and it was like four times larger than light map density for this cylinder, the shadow for this is going to look much lower resolution than it will on this uh, cylinder. And that's where you start to get uh, breakup in your environment lighting. So I'm actually going to show you what that looks like if I go into uh, light map density again. So in order to bring this view up, you go into uh, your view mode up here, which is normally uh, lit by default. You go down to optimization viewpoints, uh, or viewports and you uh, select light map density. This will allow, allow you to see what your light maps look like. So I'm going to override this light map density. I'm going to set it to a really low value, like 32, um, for just this uh, hollowed out cube. I'm going to set my mode back to uh, lit, and I'm going to build my lighting. So this is with built lighting. So as you can see, the, the shadow uh, resolution is extremely low on the surface, um, but it's still high on the cylinder. So you start to get a disconnect with your lighting. Uh, which you do not want. So whatever you do, whether you go with a really uh, dense, high-resolution uh, light map value for your entire scene, or a medium or a low, you want to make sure that all of your main objects that uh, represent your environment are um, a similar uh, light map density. You're going to start to get these disconnects and start to get these problems. I'm going to set this a little higher. Um, I had it set to 1024, so I'm going to set it to half that, which is 512. I'm going to build lighting again. As you can see, the shadow is um, still much lower res than the cylinder, but it is better than it was before. So I'm going to set this back to uh, its default value, which is four. Or the, the default value that I set for it. I'm going to build lighting one more time. As you can see, the uh, shadow is uh, higher resolution, and it matches with the, the surface, um, uh, the light map resolution of the uh, cylinder and the sphere. So if I go back into light map density, you can see where you can set back to 
Now you'll see on this uh, this sphere, some areas are going into the blue. That's because the UV map uh, wasn't all that great for this. Uh, wasn't um, the aspect ratio for the UV wasn't uh, perfect all the way across. So some areas are stretched out. Um, so light maps are only uh, they only affect uh, static or stationary objects. They have no effect on fully dynamic objects, obviously. So if I go back into um, light map density view and I set the cylinder to movable, move it. You'll see it no longer shows light maps because they're not affecting uh, the object. I said as a stationary, I'll do the same thing. Go back to static, and you can see the light map. Go back to where it was. And if I go into uh, lighting only, you get a better idea of how the shadows are working. And as I said, if you uh, make the light map density, the, the more dense your light maps are, and obviously the larger environment, how many lights you have and all stuff, it's going to increase your uh, light map uh, build time, your uh, static, uh, static lighting build time. So the best way to think of uh, light maps um, would be your, they're basically UVs for your shadow maps and light maps. So um, that's why when you import a mesh into Unreal Engine, it, by default, it, it uh, has the option check to generate uh, light map UVs. Uh, so you can have a separate UV map just for your light maps, and a separate light map for your act, or UV just for your uh, for your textures. So uh, that pretty much covers uh, everything for light maps and their importance. And uh, that's going to conclude this uh, this video on lighting in Unreal Engine. And as I said, I have uh, timestamps down in the description for each part of the video. So if you want to skip through it, you can uh, you can find that down there. If you have any questions, just um, post them in the comment section below.